Welcome to the Limitless Leaders podcast series brought to you by ASPS, the Aesthetic Society, and the American Hernia Society with the generous support of Allergan Aesthetics. My name is Dr. Ashley Amalfi and I'm a board certified plastic surgeon at the Quetella Center for Plastic Surgery in Rochester, New York. And I'm the chair of the ASPS Women Plastic Surgeons Forum and the Limitless Leaders Steering Committee member. Please join us for the Limitless Leaders podcast, where we dive into the stories of extraordinary women making a significant impact in our field, as well as the men who are supporting them to get there. We are breaking gender barriers and inspiring the next generation of leaders. You're listening to the Limitless Leaders podcast series brought to you by ASBS, the Aesthetic Society, and the American Hernia Society with generous support from Allergan Aesthetics. I'm Dr. Jana Sacco, a general and abdominal wall surgeon at the University of Florida in Jacksonville. I'd like to welcome Drs. Kant, Steinberg, and Bastine. If you guys can each introduce yourselves to our listeners. My name is Aditi Kant. Um, I am a, a board-certified plastic surgeon and a fellowship-trained craniofacial surgeon. I work at Rutgers in New Jersey. And uh, I just really find the topic of imposter syndrome uh, fascinating. I love to talk about it. And so um, thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity today. I'm Victoria Vastine. I am board certified in general surgery as well as plastic surgery. I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia at a community hospital. I've been here for a little over 25 years doing general plastic surgery and uh, essentially in private practice for 15 of that time and now employed by the hospital. And I am Ashley Steinberg, and I am a also board certified in general and plastic surgery in Houston, Texas, private practice. I've been out of uh, residency for a, a little over four years in private practice. Awesome. Well, thank you guys all so much for being here. I'm really excited about this topic. Um, I am just over a year, a year and three days um, Mm -hmm. out from fellowship and starting my first job. So imposter syndrome is something that I have definitely experienced and I'm really um, interested in our conversation to talk about. Um, And I think it's been in a lot of topics, especially lately, and we kind of know that women are more susceptible to imposter syndrome. But why do you think that that is? Do you guys have any ideas of um, why we think we're more susceptible and kind of um, start with that? I'd like to comment on that, uh, if you don't mind, partly because uh, the reason I want to comment is that I have had an interesting sort of evolution of my imposter syndrome And I felt like it was actually getting worse in some situations, which surprised me because, you know, I'm not right out of residency. I'm not um, sort of low on the totem pole from a job standpoint or anything like that. Uh, But I heard a uh, commencement speech done by Reshma Sajani, and I don't know if you know who she is, but she's the founder of the nonprofit Girls Who Code. And she's also an attorney and a politician, but she gave a commencement speech uh, May of 2023 for Smith College. And a good bit of the speech was about imposter syndrome. And from her perspective, and I think this is a little bit um, evolving as well, that imposter syndrome is not your personal failing. Yes, you're more susceptible if you're a perfectionist, if you're already in a disadvantaged position in your life or in your career. So for us, that's women in a male-dominated world. But she said it really is the result of the people in power around you. They make you feel that way. That's how they have power over you. And I found that to be fascinating because I do feel like my imposter syndrome is worse in certain situations. I had a very supportive mom, single mom. I did really well in school, had no question about that. Did really well in medical school, had no problems with that. Did uh, my clinicals in medical school in a program that encouraged me to do surgery. Did my general surgery in a very competitive but encouraging environment. And it wasn't until I actually got into my plastics fellowship that I really started to feel like 
I was the imposter, even though I was the best trained resident at the time. So there was no reason for me to feel that way other than the people around me. So, you know, I really feel like you may be predisposed to it by your personality or something like that. But I think imposter syndrome really is the way they want you to feel. <laughs> you know, you're the junior, you're the best, you know, the least trained, you know, things like that. I, and I really feel like once I heard that and started to say, you know what, that's right. So I'm not going to give them that power. I started to feel a little bit better because before I was trying to figure out what I was doing wrong psychologically, that this was getting worse. I totally agree with that. All of that. Um, an interesting thing that uh, I read in a paper about imposter syndrome that really kind of um, hit the nail on the head is that even though imposter syndrome affects the individual, no individual lives in a vacuum. We are all impacted by, um, by our environment. And um, I firmly believe and agree that like, uh, I want to validate uh, you and pretty much any other woman out there who is experiencing it, that you're not crazy. It's probably not you. You may just be reacting appropriately to um, the stimuli around you. Um, so like, for example, um, in asking uh, the question, like, why women in general. Um, imposter syndrome was actually first um, described in high achieving women in the 1970s. So it's not like, why are you know women more impacted? It's, wow, there's this phenomenon that we are observing in women who are high achieving, and we're going to call it imposter syndrome. And indeed, we've now found that sure, um, um, other groups are affected, but, uh, you know, definitely it is women that um, are the ones who are uh, sort of the most known, um, you know, to, to, you know, demonstrate this. And so I think there are just kind of broadly speaking, like uh, th three factors. Um, number one, like the confidence gap between men and women start in childhood because of the ways that we are socialized, I think, uh, the, the, the ways that we're rewarded, um, you know, more cooperation, be nice, you know, less risk taking. Um, and that sort of persists a little bit, um, in regard to, we are kind of socialized to believe that we can only be a certain way, um, I think that we are, as you know, Dr. Vastin uh, said, we experience, I, I guess, gender bias uh, sometimes um, in, in, in maybe what you were alluding to, uh, at least in part. Um, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but that does. But even s small instances like that do degrade our spirit. Um, just kind of, um, you know, death by, by a thousand cuts sometimes. Um, and sometimes we internalize that. Um, so like we have to walk this tightrope, which is that we have to um, appear competent or, you know, it's important that we, we appear competent in our jobs, but we have to walk this tightrope uh, between warmth and assertiveness. And the warmer we are, the less competent we have appear, but the more likable we are. And the more assertive we are, the more competent we appear, but the less likable we are. And we sort of intrinsically know that th there's no way to win. And this also kind of wears on our spirit sometimes. So those are my general thoughts as to why women um, may be more impacted. I'm just going to cut in and say that when I was invited to this podcast, I was like, first of all, how do they know? How did they know? <laughs> secondly, secondly, why am I getting invited to this podcast? Like I had a full imposter syndrome breakdown when I got the invitation. I read it, made sure that it was meant to be for me, looked at to see if like there was anything in the email that maybe said that it was supposed to be for somebody else because I didn't feel like I belonged in this group, you know? So I think, I think you're absolutely right. It is, I don't know if it's, 
because I did not have as a supportive of an upbringing in general surgery. I had literally people who told me that they they wanted to make me cry. They were like, this is men who said by the end of the day or by the end of the year, my goal is to make you cry. And it didn't happen, but like I did not have that support. Um, I also, I went personally, I went to a Caribbean medical school. Um, I went to undergrad in Canada at very, very small school. And I had a lot of people, and this goes back to Dr. Vestine's point is, I had a lot of people telling me that it wasn't gonna happen for me um, from the start. So I think that I personally hold on to that as much as I don't want to. And I try and tell myself, you know, I trained with the same people. I took the same tests. I'm doing all the same things. Like my Google reviews are not fake and my results are not fake. And the things I'm doing are not fake. It's, I have to tell myself that constantly, but, you know, in listening to both of you, I really am resonating with a lot of the things that you say. And I think that looking back, it was, I had personally, you know, from medical school, from the start of clinicals, I was literally told by the head of clinical rotations. He said, this is the entire group of med students. You guys go to St. George. This is a Caribbean school. None of you guys are going to be plastic surgeons unless your dad is the program director. And I took it as a challenge, but I'll never forget that. And throughout the years of me doing this five years of general surgery, th three years of plastic surgery, I've had little digs, whether it's the fact that I went to my first three years in general surgery, were at a program that weren't that great, but I transferred to a better one or that, you know, somebody finds out I went to a Caribbean med school and they make a comment about it. It still constantly is happening. Even mm -hmm. to this day where I have my own, you know, practice, and I've, you know, I graduated next to people who went to Baylor and Princeton, et cetera. So I, I really think that I'm glad that I really listened to that because I think that that is really determining my imposter syndrome. Even though I'm aware of it, I'm not sure it's going to make a difference going forward. I think it absolutely makes a difference, right? I think the main thing here and why I think this conversation is so important is understanding it. Um, because like, I really want to go back to actually what Dr. Vastian said earlier is having imposter syndrome or feeling that way is not a failure. And I, I personally forget that often. Um, I went to Caribbean medical school too. When I told them I was applying to surgery, they said, no, you're not. You can apply if you want, but you have to apply to family medicine as a backup. And I said, you should figure out how to go into my ERAS and do that because I'm not doing that. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you constantly have, have people telling you no, um, you know, and when people tell you no, I personally have the personality, like it sounds like you do, where I'm going to say, let me show you how. Um, and I think we have to have that to get where we need to go, but you're right. It kind of never stops. And I think it's, I don't know if it's disheartening or it's good to hear Dr. Vastin so far along in her career tell us that she's still having it. Um, a little bit disheartening, but also great to hear, you know, how she's overcome it so many times. And, you know, I'm sure all of you, um, you know, are more senior than me and have some, um, I think, advice for our, for our listeners and for our colleagues on, you know, it's not a failure. We need to just recognize it. We need to talk about it. And how can we handle it? Yeah, um, I would say that it's its biggest problem is that like you can't seem to internalize. Um, you can't seem to internalize any evidence that you're actually doing a good job, um, you know, when you're in the throes of it. So you, you, you can always find an excuse as to why, you know, that was just because of luck or, oh, you know, that was a fluke. Um, and, and so that's like the hardest part of it to overcome when you're kind of in the middle of it. And um, at, at least for me, um, it was really important to identify people who believed in me 
even when I didn't kind of yet believe in myself, you know, uh, others who I respected, who saw my potential, that was um, really helpful to me. Um, and I think that programs like Limitless, WPS, um, this podcast in particular, are really important because a lot of people sit there feeling like they're the only ones that feel this way, mm -hmm. that they don't have what it takes to get up at the podium or they don't have what it takes to be a leader. And, you know, I will say that my residency for plastics was where a lot of my negativity came in to play. Then I started my own practice. It was successful. I was doing really well, but I kind of lived in isolation. So I never really felt like I was doing as well as I should have been. For example, I failed my oral boards for plastics the first time, which was 100% a confidence problem. It had nothing to do with my, you know, my skills or my clinical judgment or any of that stuff. It was, I got into the orals and panicked that I wasn't qualified to be there. So, you know, I, and I actually got past that one by going into my second time, nine months pregnant saying, I dare them to fail me. <laughs> and they didn't. <laughs> But they did fail someone just as pregnant. So I feel, you know, but I had such a confidence boost going probably because of the testosterone I, from my son. But I just was like, come on, bring it on, baby. I'm ready this time. And it really made a huge difference. I think that's why it's so important to have mentors, to have a group of people that you can reach out to and talk to your fears about run cases by them because you feel like you've got to be the only one thinking about doing this, you know, and having people say, no, I don't think that's a good idea. Or you are right on track. You just keep doing what you're doing. Um, I just think it's super important. And I think that's why having people you can turn to and ask questions of is so important because that's how you get past it. You have someone saying, no, you're doing great. Keep going. I think that that's, definitely something meaningful. And that is why I stayed in Houston in particular, because I thought of, I'm not from here at all. And I have all of these people that I trained with. I needed this to continue. I thought I needed it to be successful in private practice, that I had these people who knew what I could do. I trained with many surgeons in the medical center throughout almost every hospital system. And I felt like I needed that security blanket of having those people there and going to them and talking to them just to maintain. But um, have, have any of you guys listened to the podcast, Dr. Death, that came out in like 2019 or 2018? Oh my gosh. So um, I have to be honest, I have really avoided it because okay. I feel like a person with imposter syndrome's worst nightmare is watching that. You are right. You are right. So I graduated in 2019. I went on this amazing trip to Europe. I had the best time in my life. I started practice in August of 2019. Um, I started listening to that podcast like in September, August, September. And I, I didn't, I'd never watched the, the movie or whatever, but I listened to the podcast and it, I think, put my imposter syndrome into overdrive because it's real, like that person was real, that stuff really happened. So it made me believe that there are people out there who maybe don't know or aren't great. It's very hard to fire a resident, right? It's very hard to fire a resident. It's very hard to fire a fellow. ACGME makes it very difficult. So there are people out there who are doing a bad job and don't know it or do know it or doing horrible things. And, and I was listening to this podcast and I was calling my mom and, you know, I'm in my late thirties. I was calling my mom saying, is this me? Is this what's <laughs> happening? Like, is this, you know, all of a sudden you take that responsibility. You, I, I was a resident for eight years. You know, I had that, that comfort 
of not having any responsibility for any of the patients and just learning and doing. And then all of a sudden it was all my responsibility. And I was like, what if this is me? And it really messed with me. I had to start talking to somebody. I think, you know, I actually started therapy because of, I, not just because of that, but that was all part of it. And I think that really set me off. The first six months of my practice were really hard for me. I mean, that, I think I had the imposter syndrome that just kind of revved it up a little bit, but, um, and then COVID happened. So life was just very, very weird. And I was trying to collect boards and I was like, well, I guess I just got to do what I got to do. Um, but that is really what ramped it up for me. And I agree with you. Uh, don't listen or watch it because it will absolutely. I mean, I'd be okay with it now. So Dr. Steinberg, I think you brought up an important point um, that I kind of want to talk about as far as trainees go. So obviously, as I mentioned, I haven't been out very long and the imposter syndrome hit pretty hard when you first start, as I think maybe it's not even imposter syndrome. Maybe that's just normal when you start. Mm -hmm. But what can we do or what should we be doing for our trainees to prepare them for, for these thoughts and for these um, you know, things that can come into your mind that you really have to uh, talk yourself out of, like, like many of you have mentioned. I'm going to tell you that in my fellowship, I was the only female, you know, in, in independent programs these days, there are so few of them that uh, there are very, very few females in them, I've noticed compared to the integrated programs, and I was one of six. And I'm going to tell you right now, those five people, those five other ones are not having any issues. They're not, there was no imposter syndrome. They're driving around in McLarens and wearing suits and telling every woman that passes by them that they're plastic surgeons, that they're fancy plastic surgeons. And I don't know if it's maybe continuing things like this, like um, this leadership, the WPS, things where these strong women get together. And that's when I feel, when I'm around these people, I do feel imposter syndrome when I, when I speak to you guys and when I'm in a group with these strong, talented women, I still feel it, but it also empowers me that maybe one day I can be there. Maybe one day I can be on the podium. Maybe one day I can be in a leadership position in a role like these people I so admire. Um, so I think maybe having more access to things like that for residents or fellows during training. Well, WPS has been encouraging and sponsoring women residents to come to the women's retreat and also sponsoring them to come to um, the national meeting for the very purpose of getting them hooked into sort of a network. So I, I definitely have a fair amount of institutional memory with regards to the WPS. And when we first started having the women's retreat, you know, it started very much as a social thing. And it was an opportunity for women to kind of get together and not have the stresses of being the minority at a conference or whatever. And we gradually evolved to making it more educational. But at the beginning, we were not allowed to have clinical discussions at our retreat. We were not to compete with any learning opportunities that the, the other meetings had. So it took us a long time to get permission to do sort of tips and tricks and pearls and problems kind of starting. And I tell you, that was really helpful for a lot of people. Just getting up and talking about a problem they had and how they handled it and listening to all these women say, wow, that's a really neat trick or that's pretty cool. You know, how many cases like that have you done? And then you start to realize you have just as much experience as the guys that stand up at the podium and put on table results as their final results. <laughs> you know, so um, I really do feel like that's one way is and I used to go to the women's surgery group at the university where I am. That was a general surgery program you know, they would invite me to come and talk to them because there were no other women plastic surgeons in town. So I had no peer group here. 
but um, the general surgery group, you know, they, they wanted to hear everything I had to say. So, um, you know, I, I just think that that peer and that mentorship process really is what helps residents. Because if you compare yourself to the average overly cocky male counterpart, and I'm, I'm not saying that all males are overly cocky, but I will say that that's who tends to breed imposter syndrome in the women, you know, it's hard for you to think that you are worth it. I mean, you're looking at these people going, wow, I am not that confident that the decision I just made is the right one. Yet he's tripping over himself doing stupid stuff and saying, isn't it beautiful? You know? I've had those same men, by the way, actually say, how dare women have their own meeting, have their own, you know, we know how we have our own setup at ASBS and the aesthetic meeting. We have our own little women's um, area. I've yeah. had multiple other um, docs, obviously men say to me, I can't believe that they're allowing that. That's so prejudicial or what it, what if we did that, we'd get in so much trouble. I'm like, uh, that's what it's the entire been. meeting they've done that. <laughs> yeah, like that's what it is. Down to the simply dressed vendor aides walking the the floor, you know. Yeah. I've heard that a lot too. One, they come in to take the pink stuff out of the WPS booth, like, you know, why do we get free umbrellas in Seattle and they don't? And I and they've said that, and I've just said, look around, this entire place is yours. We just want a little bitty booth where we can sit here and have a cup of coffee or a Coke and talk to each other. I did suffer from imposter syndrome when I, I first started my plastic surgery residency. Um, and sure, my confidence grew um, you know, through the years, uh, but I still kind of felt like I didn't internalize it as much as you know, some of my peers, particularly my, my male peers. And um, I think and the thing that really helped me like feel like I was part of this plastic surgery, um, you know, community, this greater community where um, I would go to meetings, but uh, I, I never thought that I would really be, quote unquote, you know, one of them was, you know, the WPS. Uh, I joined in my fellowship year and um, I was given opportunities, you know, maybe to give a talk here or there, to which my response was, who me? Like, who the heck? I, but um, you know, I was I, I was bold and I took the opportunities and you know sometimes uh, it it went well and and my confidence really grew from that. So I really do credit you know the WPS and and this sort of um, mentorship that you get through there just uh, as a big part of my growth professionally. So um, I want to echo what the others have said in that regard. I do just want to uh, answer the original question quickly about how do we help people going forward? I've thought about this a lot. And I think in addition to, you know, continuing, um, you know, mentorship and the WPS, because that's huge, but like on a small scale, if you work with trainees or students at all, just being aware that, you know, this happens, it happens often. Um, and, uh, just being open about it and kind of most importantly, not, not um, penalizing them for not being confident because sometimes people, you know, mistake uh, a lack of confidence for a lack of competence. And that's the problem that we face as women. Uh, if we're not feeling extremely confident about something, then, you know, people will think that we don't know the answer or know anything, for example. Um, but that's not necessarily true. You know, there are many reasons why we might not be confident about an answer. So like us knowing that about a trainee or a student, um, and then just kind of, kind of looking into their answer a little bit more, maybe helping them, um, uh, helping them realize that they do know more than they think. I think that that would go a long way. That's a really good point. I saw recently this teacher, I think she was like middle school, sixth, seventh, eighth grade level. It was uh, this report about progressive teaching and she teaches a math class. And 
she was really trying something unique, and that is you don't raise your hand to answer a question. So what she has everyone do at the beginning, like if she's going to put a question up on the board, she has them hold their fist at the level of their belly button. And if they want to contribute to the answer, they put their thumb up. So no one else in the room can see that their thumb is up. And it does two things. One, it encourages people to put their thumb up when they might have been hesitant to put their hand up. And two, it doesn't shut down the conversation because when people put their hands up, people stop putting their hands up. Somebody's already going to answer the question. But if they put their thumb up and nobody knows whose thumbs are up, then she can go around the room and call on people and ask them what they want to add. And as it turns out, more people contribute. The topic gets developed in a more broad fashion than simply simply giving the quote right answer. Mm -hmm. And it engages more people. And then those people begin to have more confidence in their ability to participate in the conversation. And what you were saying around the OR table or in the clinic and things like that is exactly that. You're encouraging them to continue to participate in the conversation. And sometimes a small win can lead to more confidence, which leads to larger wins. If it's an unsafe environment for a person to take a chance, then they're not going to take the chance and they're not going to um, ever know their abilities. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that the ability for us to be vulnerable and show that, you know, just even with this conversation, obviously, um, that we're all going through this and that it's normal. And to show that to the trainees, I think, um, you know, it's something I try to be very open with, especially with my chiefs when I'm, you know, barely a year ahead of them. Um, And I'm like, I may not be able to let you do this whole case because I still need some control in the OR, but hopefully I can, you know, be vulnerable with them and talk about these things and the transitions. And I think allowing them to feel like it's a safe space to talk about, because I know, you know, when I was a trainee, a lot of the time it was like, do you have the answer? If you like have an answer, even if it's wrong, just say something. And probably saying the wrong thing isn't great. Yes, we all have to make decisions. We're surgeons, but like you said, um, I think encouraging people to have those small wins um, really give them the confidence to have bigger wins later, like you said. And most often there isn't just one answer. And, Mm -hmm. And I think also the opposite of what you're saying is when, when there is a wrong answer, not making someone feel like lesser or lower, you know, because of it, really taking that opportunity to teach and see if your teaching and your time can potentially help that person as opposed to, you know, just kind of reinforcing that feeling. So are there any other um, topics that you all want to touch on as far as imposter syndrome? I just think there's been a lot of really good comments tonight about the fact that almost everyone has it to some degree. It's a question of whether or not you can kind of work yourself through it and what are ways we can do to help out so that we can hopefully make it not be women are more susceptible than men (laughs) to this type of feeling. Although I will say that in general, I do think women are, are more concerned and I don't, don't necessarily think it's a gender, maybe a cultural thing, but I do think it's within our genetic makeup to be more concerned about how we fit into our societies and how we care for our family and our societies. And maybe I'm being gender biased with that statement, but I think we do want more feedback I think just talking about it too and making it, you know, not hiding the fact that we feel this way because I think part of that imposter syndrome is not necessarily letting everybody know that you feel a certain way because sometimes you have to fake it till you make it. Sometimes you have to show that confidence because if, if I walked in 
to see patients and I let them know how I was feeling, I would never book a surgery. I'd never book a case. I wouldn't pay my bills, right? So I think we're so used to kind of pushing that down and dealing with it ourselves and internalizing it, but maybe opening up the dialogue and having this conversation more with peers, obviously not with your patients, but <laughs> with with peers or friends or parents or therapists or whoever it is we need to talk to, uh, but also making it more of a known thing to other people in your maybe colleague groups or something so that they know that they can talk to you about it too. And they know that it's not just them, just like we feel like it's it's just us when it happens to us. Yeah, I, I think it's really important that we, um, you know, take away the the shame that that you you, you might feel about it. Like I, I certainly did. Um, because it is extremely common and probably you're not the only one in the room who has it on any given day, right? And then um, I, I also really think it's important, um, you know, as I mentioned, to to surround yourself with people who believe in you, not like exclusively, but at least like a couple. And then also be kind of mindful about the things that did go right, you know, maybe reflect on it and think like, you know, what are my contributions to it going right? Like, you know, make an effort to internalize it a little bit. Like, uh, don't ascribe every, uh, every good thing that happens to you to luck because, you know, chances are you're, you're working really hard, you're learning a lot and, um, and it is a result of your ability um, you know, your intrinsic ability. And so you have to internalize that. It's important to remain humble because that keeps you growing. It it keeps you, um, you know, trying to get better. Imposter syndrome is not the same thing as uh, being humble because being humble is a good thing, but imposter syndrome is when you're when it's it's taken to the extreme and so that's really what we're trying to to tease out and uh conquer i guess yeah absolutely i agree with everything that you said i think it's really important that we kind of stop and you know one technique that i've tried to use myself is where i just kind of what you just said really where you stop and you think well okay am i credentialed for the to give this talk at this meeting and you look back well, yes, I did this fellowship and I've done these things. And I gave this talk at another meeting and this person put me up for this because they they believe in me. And these are the credentials that are real and kind of mm-hmm. take that negative doubt out of our out of our minds. And I think that having a support system like you all, I think, have mentioned is probably one of the the most important things, having mentors and sponsors and family and friends and colleagues who we can talk to about this and, you know, who can remind us like how great we really are doing because we are all doing great. And I think that's just the most important thing that we are all really lucky to have and need to continue to surround ourselves with those types of people. I also think it's important to like, also at least acknowledge to yourself if there is an intrinsic, sorry, an extrinsic factor that's, you know, contributing to it. Um, if, you know, maybe the culture, uh, of the place you're at may be contributing to it or, um, you know, gender bias, I think it's okay to acknowledge that to yourself because that's just an obstacle to overcome as opposed to internalizing the whole thing and saying, Hey, this is all my responsibility. This is all my fault that I feel this way. There are probably other factors at play, you know? Yeah, I think that's um, a really good point. And I kind of want to jump off on that because it's almost easy for us to all talk about this, right? We're all being very supportive of each other. We're all sharing our experiences. Um, But what advice can you give people who are maybe in a setting where, you know, they don't feel that way? 
um, or they, you know, have microaggressions or some gender bias um, happening in their institution or in their practice. Find one of us. <laughs> yeah, like make make those connections. The the thing that I did that was most helpful for me is I went to every meeting when I was a resident, um, when I was an attending my first year, I paid the money that was hard to pay to go to the aesthetic society. You know, when you have to, when you're out that first year and you actually have to pay for the meeting, you have to pay for getting there and everything. I did it because I knew that this was my opportunity to meet the people that I could maybe have these conversations with that I could, in addition to, you know, talking to them about surgery or problems I might have, I could possibly talk to them about these things, you know, get close network, find, find your people. And whether it's, you know, in town or. Yeah, I think a lot of us can resonate with that. I mean, I've really enjoyed, I'm obviously a general surgeon and a lot of um, the people that are involved in the limitless leaders campaign are plastic surgeons. And I've really loved getting to know all of you and um, kind of learning from the many differences that that kind of occur in plastic surgery, I think from general surgery. Um, and you, you all do really have a really, I think, close knit WPS, which is really awesome to hear about. Um, my first time at the limitless summit two years ago, and, um, it was just so amazing to hear all the stories, um, from the plastic surgeons and the diversity I think is, um, in practice is so much more than what we kind of have in general surgery. So it's really interesting to hear, solo private practice, group private practice, academics, hospital groups. Um, and so I think going to these big meetings and, um, you know, our, like our meeting, like Limitless, um, just really allows you to build these connections that can be lasting for a really long time. I think the Association of Women Surgeons is also a good resource, but in some respects, their success has resulted in it being such a big group, it's sometimes hard to find those more personal connections, particularly if you're uh, introverted, which I am, and you don't know anyone as you go into a meeting or something like that, you kind of feel like you're just going to walk around the periphery. I will say that um, leadership training really helped me a lot in that because it, it taught me how to work a cold room and how to kind of get your courage up, how to look for a group that you have a better chance of approaching and getting into a conversation with. And little things like that, that you don't really realize are super important if you are an introvert with imposter syndrome, <laughs> because you do need to ha kind of coach yourself through how to make those approaches, how to, you know, be the only one in the room you think that doesn't know anybody. Um, and hopefully if you walk up to a group, they're gonna welcome you, uh, much more likely to be the case if a group of, of women surgeons, in my opinion, than nurses <laughs> um, or male surgeons. But uh, I do think that just some training in it is important. Trying to, as you say, fake it till you make it, but with a little bit of science behind it. In regard to to, I, I guess, all aspects um, of your career, which I'm, I'm still very early. I'm only in my second year, but it's really helped me out just to, even if I don't know if um, something's, if, if, you know, something's going to go well, like a talk or something like that, I, I still try. I still, you know, put myself out there. Um, and the same goes in regard to networking, I suppose, even though, uh, that one is much more nerve wracking still. Um, but you have to just, I don't know, just try. Like, you know, what's the worst that can happen, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's where we build a lot of our relationships. And I, I agree. I think the smaller organizations are a little bit easier. Um, like AHS is a smaller kind of hernia family. Um, not too many of us. So for me, I felt very accepted there very quickly. Um, but again, I think like you all said, we have to put ourselves out there and build those meaningful relationships so that we have some support um, when we are going through the bouts of imposter syndrome that I'm sure we will all continue to go through. All right. Well, I would like to thank our remarkable group of guest speakers. This has been 
um, an amazing talk. Um, and I really want to thank you all for sharing your expertise on imposter syndrome and your own personal stories and words of wisdom. You've all been excellent guests. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Limitless Leaders podcast series brought to you by ASPS, the Aesthetic Society, and the American Hernia Society with the generous support of Allergan Aesthetics. We hope you enjoyed our conversation today and gained valuable insights and inspiration from our guests. Please check out other episodes of your favorite podcast platform. You can download them directly from ASPS Ednet. Stay tuned for new seasons, exciting new episodes, where we will continue to celebrate and empower women leaders in plastic surgery and in general surgery. Thank you.